my name is Jason. Um, there's uh, some ways you can contact me. There's some logos of places I've worked. Uh, I've been a, a solar committer for a couple of years. I'm on the PMC. Um, and I, I've spent a, a good bit of time working with some of Solar's plugins. So hopefully uh, everybody can learn something today. Um, one, one thing that I wanted to, to start off talking about is that security is, is really kind of a, a huge topic in solar, and solar is a, a huge project itself. Um, so there's a, a ton of ideas and there's a ton of features that impact security, and that's way too much for, for anybody to cover in a, a single talk. Um, so I, I wanted to start by talking about the things that I'm not going to cover today. Um, there's a lot of other resources out there on solar security. There's been solar security talks in a lot of the other conferences in past years, and there's been some uh, this year as well. Um, so I just wanted to point you guys at, at some of those and, and lay out some of the things that I'm not going to cover. Um, so I'm not going to try to build an argument for, for why you need security or, or why it's important to, to have in solar. Um, there's a, a great talk from a committer named Onchem where, where this is laid out pretty clearly a couple years ago. It's, it's on YouTube. It's pretty easy to find. Uh, we're also not going to spend any time talking about any of the third-party security plugins that Solar has. Uh, Solar supports third-party plugins. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. But there's uh, plugins specifically for Apache Ranger and Apache Sentry um, that uh, are kind of popular. But, but again, we're not going to talk about them today. Um, we're also not going to talk about Kerberos support much. Um, that could really probably be a talk in itself. Um, if you're interested, a, a committer named Ishan uh, did a talk a couple years ago that, that touched on this a lot more. Um, similarly, we're, we're not going to talk about Solar's SSL support or how to set up Zookeeper security and Zookeeper SSL. Uh, those are both really kind of foundational to, um, to using any of the security plugins that Solar has. Um, but the, the configuration for those is all pretty well documented, um, and it's, it's discussed in, in Ishan's security talk that, that I mentioned before. Um, so there's, there's already coverage, there's already resources for that if that's what you're looking to learn. Um, so uh, again, all these other security talks are easy to find on YouTube if, if those are things you're interested in. Um, it, at the end of the, my slides, I'll have a link where you, you can go out and find some of those um, if, if that's easier too. So what are we going to spend time on today, then? Uh, so I'm going to start by taking kind of a high-level look at, at Solar's plugin framework for security. This is really how Solar supports authentication and authorization um, through, through different plugins. So we'll, we'll take a look at those, and we'll look at some of the plugins offered out of the box. Uh, we'll also look at some of the other things you're going to need to have set up before you actually try to go into production with any of these plugins. Uh, after taking a look at that at a high level, I think that the best way to spend our time is to look at two plugins specifically in detail. Uh, so I wanted to talk about Solar's uh, JWT or JWT authentication plugin, which is the, the newest authentication option that Solar has. Uh, and we're also going to talk about Solar's rule-based authorization plugin. Uh, neither of these has really been covered fully by any of the other presentations or any of the resources or the, the ref guide out there. Uh, so I think they're worth our time today. And particularly the, the rule-based authorization in particular is um, it's a little counterintuitive in how it works, and there's a lot of users out there that, that have confusion about it on, on the mailing list and in these different other places. Uh, so I'm hope, hoping that we can clear some of that up today. Uh, so we'll finish up by, by talking a bit about troubleshooting some of the security plugins, and I'll take questions if there's time left or if um, anyone wants to stick around. Uh, so first up, let's talk a little bit about the authentication and authorization framework that Solar has. Uh, Solar supports, supports authentication and authorization plugins with a, a plugin framework, and each plugin is responsible for handling one of three things. You either handle authentication, or you handle authorization, or you handle audit logging, which is kind of recording and tracking security events. So uh, users that, that um, make a request and either succeed or, or get rejected to, to access a particular resource. Um, so Solar ships with a, a handful of plugins for these different options out of the box. Uh, and, and admittedly, most of these are focused on authentication. There's four authentication plugins. Um, but still, with the options there, there's a lot out of the box that can cover a, a lot of security use cases. Uh, and if, if the things that are available aren't good enough for you, uh, Solar supports um, kind of adding your own external plugins as well. So you can kind of roll your own if, if uh, you do have to. Uh, 
So whichever plugins you end up using, the, the configuration for these is going to live in a single JSON file called security.json. And that's going to live either locally on disk if you're running Solar Standalone, or it's going to live in Zookeeper if you're running Solar Cloud. Uh, and we're going to be looking at a lot of security.json snippets today. Um, I, I mentioned this before I started, but if anybody has trouble reading the, the JSON on the board, they might want to move a little closer to the screen uh, on one side or the other. Uh, so format-wise, security.json is going to have three top-level properties, and in one for each plugin type. Uh, this example just has authentication and authorization, but you would have audit logging as well if you're using that. Um, and, and under each of these top-level uh, properties, there's a class that, that specifies the, the plugin that you're going to be using. So this example here uses a, a basic auth plugin for authentication, and it uses the rule-based authorization plugin for authorization. Uh, beyond that class attribute, the, the JSON and the configuration there is going to vary based on the plugin. And we'll, we'll see a lot of examples of that later on. So in addition to, to directly changing um, your security.json solar offers APIs for authentication and authorization that, that let you make tweaks to this file. So you can either use those APIs or you can upload this file directly into Zookeeper or change it locally on disk if, if that's how you're using uh, solar. Both are, are pretty popular options. So these are the plugins that Solar ships with as of 8.2. For authentication, there's a few options, as we mentioned. There's a, a Kerberos authentication option and a, a Hadoop authentication option. And both of these are, are commonly used with Kerberos. Um, the Kerberos plugin is a little, they're both, uh, they're both, Kerberos is used commonly with Hadoop, but the Kerberos plugin can be used kind of independent of that. Whereas the Hadoop authentication plugin is, is more tied to the Hadoop, Hadoop environment. Um, but it also kind of has a different set of configuration levers and options that expose different, um, different things. So there, there is some differentiation there. Uh, next is the, the basic authentication. This is kind of your standard username, password that gets uh, bundled up in an authentication header uh, and, and sent along with requests. Uh, last in the list of authentication options is the JOT plugin, which authenticates users based on a, a signed JSON web token provided in a header. Um, as we mentioned, there's, there's only one uh, authorization option, and that's rule-based authorization. Um, the rule-based plugin is pretty config-heavy. Uh, admins are going to specify access rules or permissions, and uh, those are going to get mapped onto users to control their access. Uh, in terms of audit logging, Solar technically has two options available. Uh, the first is the Solar Log plugin, which records security events in a log file, um, pretty much what the, the name says. And the, the other option is a multi-destination. So if you wanted to write your own third-party um, audit logging plugin, you could use multi-destination to send those events to, to multiple different streams. Um, and, and as I mentioned before, we're going to focus in detail on uh, the JOT and the rule-based authorization plugins. So one thing that's important to remember before you use any of the plugins that we just talked about is that there's really no point at all if you're not taking some kind of basic privacy measures as well in your solar cluster. Uh, particularly, SSL needs to be turned on in solar, and, and Zookeeper security needs to be set up, again, if, if you're in solar cloud. SSL protects passwords, tickets, et cetera, that users might send to solar, and Zookeeper security prevents anyone from going in to look or to edit your security.json. And those are both really kind of uh, setting a foundation for achieving any kind of security in solar. Um, only with both of them enabled is, is there any kind of guarantee that, that things are going to be private enough to build authentication and authorization on top of. It's, it's hardly secure if anybody can go change the settings and, and tweak things as they, as they like. OK, so first up, let's spend a little time talking about the JOT authentication plugin. Uh, JOT authentication in, in solar or in any system is really kind of a two-step process. First, users are going to send a request to a server called an identity provider. Uh, sometimes you'll hear them called authentication or authorization servers as well. Um, and then the user is going to send credentials or, or some secret or something to identify the user to the identity provider and, and prove that they are who they claim to be. Um, so the identity provider is going to look at that information and it's going to reply back to the user with some metadata about them. Uh, and this is going to be a token, and the token has the user's name. It'll have uh, some timestamps for, for when it was issued and how long it's good for, uh, and it's going to be signed by the identity provider to make sure that none of this information can be tampered with or changed or forged in any way. Uh, 
in this token that comes back is the actual JOT. Um, again, the JOT stands for JSON Web Token, and we'll, we'll see why in a second. So the second step of this process is that once the user um, gets their JOT, they can make their request to Solar and send the JOT along. Uh, Solar gets the token and, and using the identity provider's public key, it verifies the signature, makes sure that everything checks out. Um, so if, if the signature is valid and the token isn't expired, then Solar can treat the user as authenticated. Otherwise, Solar is gonna reject the request. Uh, so that's the basic idea behind JOT authentication. But to understand a little better how this gets configured in Solar, um, a lot of the configuration options involve particulars in, in what the JOT format looks like and what actually is in that token. Uh, so we'll look a little closer at, at how that token is actually formed and, and what's, what it typically looks like. So there's three main components to a JOT, a signature, a header, and a payload. I already mentioned the, the signature briefly. This uh, makes sure that none of the header or payload content can be changed without detection. Uh, the header contains information about how to read the JOT. The algorithm used for the signature, uh, here we have, uh, it's, it's an HMAC, SHA, um, and, and so on. Uh, the payload is where the user metadata actually lives. This is the real meat of a, of a JOT. Uh, each property in the payload is called a JOT claim, and there's a, a handful of claims that are standard between a, a bunch of different identity providers. Uh, the first is uh, IAT or IAT. This is the time that the JOT was issued on or issued at. The second is EXP or expiry. This is how long the JOT's good for. Once you get past that timestamp, uh, Solar should reject this JOT. Sub is, is typically the username, the, the user that this JOT represents or stands for. Uh, and the last standard claim we have here is ISS, and that's the issuer claim. This is some kind of identifier for the identity provider that, that issued this JOT and kind of stands behind it. So in addition to these standard claims, JOTs also contain arbitrary custom claims as well, based on the, the implementation involved. Um, so, so different identity providers are gonna include different little bits of metadata about users. So naturally, Solar's JOT authentication plugin is gonna look at the sub and the expiry claims. You have to know the user, you have to know how long the, the token is good for. Um, but it can also look at some of these other custom claims as well, and we'll, we'll see that in a minute. So we have these three sections in our JOT, and when the identity provider sends it out, it's gonna take them individually, and it's going to base64 encode them, and it's gonna concatenate them together, uh, separated by periods. So you end up with this one uh, long uh, ASCII-like token here in the middle, uh, and this encoded ASCII string is the JOT. This is what gets returned by the identity provider and what users are gonna send along to Solar. Uh, the last line on this slide here is just an example of how you would send this to Solar to, to submit a query. You'd put it in a, a header that starts with authorization and bear. So now that we have a, a better idea of what, uh, what JOTs actually look like, let's see how Solar's JOT authentication plugin uh, is configured to, to make some checks based on this. So right off the bat, Solar can't trust anything in the JOT, it, it doesn't matter what we do with the claims until we are able to verify the signature and make sure that the, the JOT is valid. So the first order of business in configuring the JOT authentication plugin is getting Solar access to the identity provider's public key uh, to make sure that the JOT's unmodified, it hasn't been tampered with. Uh, so usually this comes in the format of a JSON web key, uh, which is um, kind of part of, part of how we, we uh, verify these signatures. Um, the, the JSON web key uh, typically comes as a JSON blob that contains uh, the key contents. In this case, uh, E and N are the key contents. And some metadata about how to use the key, what, um, what type it is, what, um, what algorithms used to, to do the signing, uh, stuff like that. So Solar's JOT authentication plugin offers three ways to configure which JSON web key to use. Uh, the first that we see on this slide is you can just include the JSON web key in your security.json as it is here. Um, this is, is simple, it's straightforward. Solar never has to go out and actually talk to the identity provider. It can just use the key it has, it gets the token, it never has to go out anywhere else. Um, but the downside of this is that the key is uh, somewhat hard-coded. Um, if the identity provider chooses or, or needs to revoke their key pair, or they need to rotate keys or do something else, uh, 
um, then the, this plugin has to be reconfigured manually, and there's some lag there that can cause security problems. Uh, so an alternative to this is that the JSON uh, web token plugin lets you provide a URL to fetch the, the key from. Instead of hard coding it, you can fetch it from a URL and it gets cached and refetched every hour or every half an hour. Um, and that's configurable. So this is done with the, the JWK URL property, is in the example here. Um, this is a, a bit more appropriate for production, you see it a bit more often. Um, is it can handle key changes a little more flexibly. Uh, the third option, the last option for getting solar access to a JSON web key is through the use of the well-known URL property, which uh, also takes a, a URL, but this one is specifically a URL to an OpenID Connect compliant endpoint. Uh, OpenID Con Connect is a spec that's used by some identity providers that uh, solar can use to, to find the JSON web key it needs, uh, but it also gives it some other additional configuration, like it tells it the, the issuer to expect and some other uh, ancillary properties like that. So the job plugin configuration requires one of these properties. You either have to give it a, a JWK, a JWK URL, or a well-known URL to verify the signature on the job. With the signature verified, the rest of the job plugin options involve checking various claims in the job itself. You verified the job's valid, now you can actually look at the contents. Uh, and all of these are optional, by the way. Um, so first here we have a scope property, and this takes in a, a regex that much mat, must match a scope claim in the jot, if your, your jot has one. Uh, if if the, the claim isn't matched, then the token will get rejected and the user will get a 403. Uh, similarly, the require exp property controls whether the expiry scope that we saw in the jot itself, it controls whether that's required or not. So if you have a jot without an expiry claim, then that jot is, is good for all eternity, um, which can be problematic security-wise. So the require expiry um, property allows us to disallow that from happening. It, it forces an expiry claim. Uh, the claims match property takes a complex JSON object and allows users to configure um, kind of expected claim name and claim value pairs that JWT tokens must have in order to be accepted. So this lets Solar handle a lot of the custom claims that, that we mentioned the JWT sometimes have, is you can set up regexes for these in your claims match block. Uh, the algorithm whitelist, or ALG whitelist, uh, instructs Solar to only accept certain signing algorithms from the IDP. Uh, this is useful if you don't have full control of your IDP, but you want to be picky security-wise. Um, and the last property we have here is the, the cache duration for the JWK key. This is valid if, if you're fetching the, the key using a URL and you want to control how often it gets refreshed. Uh, so the example above shows how all of these can kind of be put together. Uh, you'll notice that the, the JOT authentication plugin offers a, a handful of different config properties. Um, luckily, those, these are all kind of independent and, and um, they don't interact with each other in any way. They're all, they're all pretty straightforward. Um, unfortunately, that's not the case with all of Solar security plugins. Uh, in fact, the other plugin we're gonna dig into a little bit today, the, the rule-based authentication plugin, um, is, is the cause of a lot of confusion and frustration on the mailing list. Um, specifically compared to the JOT plugin, the rule-based authorization plugin only has a, a few different properties. Um, in its configuration, but the, the rules for how those interact and how those actually end up getting parsed and interpreted by Solar is um, really kind of tricky and counterintuitive to what a lot of people expect. Conceptually, the rule-based authorization is, is pretty straightforward. Uh, administrators write permissions, and these permissions control access to Solar functionality. Administrators are going to rely on either predefined permissions or they can create their own. And custom permissions are, are really flexible. They can be written to apply to specific collections, specific API paths, specific HTTP methods, or even request parameters. Um, so again, really flexible here, the, the language for how permissions are built out. And we'll see a couple examples of that shortly. Um, each permission also lists the roles that can access that described chunk of functionality. And each user is gonna have one or more roles. Uh, 
So when a request comes into Solar, Solar will find the permission that applies. It will look at the list of roles allowed by that permission, and then it'll look at the user that made the request and see whether that lines up. Uh, so here we have an example of a, a predefined permission syntax. And up at the top, there's all the different predefined permissions that exist. Um, um, so I, to use one of these predefined permissions, you just reference them by name in your security.json. Uh, so the name here isn't just a descriptor. Um, so read, for example. Uh, it's, it's actually a syntactically important piece of information, and that's... Um, that's something to, to keep an eye on later because that can cause a lot of confusion. A lot of people will create a permission that has the name read and then they'll give it a path or they'll give it a particular collection that it applies to. And a lot of times that doesn't play nicely. We'll, we'll see an example of that later. Um, so usually a predefined position or permission will have a, a name attribute and the roles that it applies to. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, here's an example of a custom permission. Uh, custom permissions in rule-based author are really pretty powerful. You, you define them, um, again, based on collections or request handlers or params, or uh, you can even specify the, the HTTP verb or method, so get versus post. Um, and you can see here we've set up a custom permission that applies to all collections. Uh, you can see the, the wildcard in the collection property there. Um, and it's going to prevent most users from running the export handler. Um, only admin users are going to be able to do that. Um, so maybe somebody set this up because they were, they were worried about load and they thought this might help in some way. Um, any questions on the syntax for a custom permission? Great. Uh, so now that you've seen the permission syntax, I, I wanted to, to bring things together with a quick example. Um, here we've got a security.json snippet for rule-based authorization, and there's two users. There's an admin user, and there's a dev, dev user. And each user has one role, either admin or dev. Pretty, pretty simple. Um, so we also have two permissions in our list. The, the first gives all the roles, so everyone, access to the collection foo. The second permission is a, a predefined permission called all. And all is kind of a special permission. It, it matches all API requests. So the second permission says, you know, the whole rest of Solar, everything except this one collection foo, uh, that should get locked down to the admin role. Does that make sense so far? So does that imply that it's a top down, so the top rule is going to override the, the bottom, like it's kind of like hierarchy like that? Uh, so the question was, um, does the, the top permission supersede the bottom permission? Is, is it ordered in that way? And the question is, or the answer is kind of, uh, we're going we're gonna to talk a lot about it. But that's, uh, that is definitely the, um, the, the, the trick about this is that it's, it's not top down, but you would totally expect it to be. Like that's the, the totally reasonable assumption, but it ends up not being that way. Um, so now imagine that, that our dev user um, makes a request. Let's say they want to query the system collection. Uh, so rule-based auth is going to kick in, and what's our first step? We need to find a permission that applies to this request. Uh, so the first permission here only applies to foo. That's not the collection we're querying, so we can throw that one out. Um, so it's going to be the second permission that actually applies here. We're going to come down to our all permission, and that's the one that's actually going to, to control or govern this request. Uh, so we, we get the second permission, and we see it restricts access to just the admin role. Um, does dev user have access to the admin role? No. So Solar is going to reject this request. Um, does that make sense, everybody? Okay, awesome. Um, so on the surface, conceptually at least, um, rule-based auth is, is pretty straightforward. Um, but really, there's, there's more going on here that, that meets the eye, as, as you pointed out. Um, particularly in step one, figuring out which permission is actually going to control your request or, or govern the request. Um, I kind of did some hand-waving that, that you called me out on a little bit. Uh, but we're going to get into that, because it's... Um, unfortunately, Solar's behavior here is really kind of unintuitive. Uh, and this is where users run into problems. Um, there's a few quirks to how Solar does that permission resolution and, and figures out which permission specifically controls a request that are really worth walking through. 
the first of these that I want to point out is that um, remember the first step. Solar finds a permission to control the request, and it's, it's always one. And that's true even if you have multiple permissions in your uh, configuration that would match a given request. Uh, so imagine a, a query comes in and your security.json has two read permissions. Uh, read is a solar uh, predefined permission that allows access to different querying endpoints. Um, so we have two read permissions here. What role is going to be allowed? What roles are going to be allowed to query um, with the, the permission list that we have here? Does anybody have a guess? A uh, couple, couple different answers. Somebody said both, somebody said dev, somebody said admin. Uh, and the answer is just dev. Only one permission is going to control the request, even if multiples match. Uh, so the, the admin rule here is always going to be useless. It's, it's never going to have an effect. Um, and, and obviously, this causes a lot of head scratching on the, the mailing list and um, elsewhere. Uh, there's a clear permission here that, that gives the admin role access, but uh, it's never going to have any effect. So this is something to, to really watch out for in your configuration. Um, if you wanted to fix this, if you wanted both to have access, uh, you could combine them into a single permission like this. Um, the role field, the role property can be multi-valued. You can give it an array. Um, and we're able to do this, luckily, because this is kind of a staged example, and both of the permissions were identical. Uh, there's a lot of cases in, in practice where you can't do this. Uh, so the next quirk in, in how these permissions get chosen uh, is that when Solar looks for a matching permission, it doesn't just start at the top of the list. Um, it doesn't just start at the top and work its way down until it finds something that matches. Uh, instead, what Solar does is it's going to look at the request, and it's going to try to classify it a few different ways. Um, is this a request to an admin API? Is this a request that uh, hits a specific collection? What, what path or what request handler is using? And what Solar is going to try to do is it's going to try to give precedence to permissions that um, mention those values specifically. Solar tries to find the most specific rule first and apply that. And then it will go back to other more general rules. Um, so users that are new to the rule-based plugin ex expected to find permissions again kind of top to bottom. Um, but what Solar actually does, and I kind of wish I was kidding about this, is this. Um, so rule-based auth is going to divide requests first off into two different categories, requests that go to collections and admin requests, things that go to, to admin APIs or metrics APIs or things like that. So for admin requests, Solar is going to start by pulling out all of the admin permissions that it has. And once it has that group, it's going to look at the path of the request and it's going to check permissions that call out the path specifically. A lot of times these are, these are custom permissions that have that slash path uh, attribute. Um, so it's going to check things that, that match the path specifically. If none of those that match, then Solar is going to look at their other permissions that don't specify a specific path. Maybe they're more general and, and try to apply one of those. For collection-based requests, the ordering is a little more involved. Solar is going to try to give precedence not just based on the path, but on the collection as well. Um, so what you get is that Solar is going to look at the request, and it's going to identify the collection and the path that the request is going to. First, it's going to check permissions that specifically call out both, both the collection and the path. Then it's going to check permissions that are specific to the collection, but maybe don't specify a path. Uh, Next, it's going to check permissions that are specific to the path, but don't mention an individual collection. And then it's going to check permissions specific to neither the path nor the collection, so things that are very general. So the, the ordering here is, is really kind of um, involved, but the, the general just to keep in mind is that Solar is considering the permissions that are more specific first, and then trying to pick out the more general ones. Uh, go ahead. Yes, okay. right. If you, if you say collection equals wildcard, then it treats it as applying to all collections. And, and it, it falls under um, rules three and four on, the, on that side list there, things that apply to all collections. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
OK. OK, so let's try another example. Uh, we've got three permissions on our list here, and a request comes in for, let's say, an admin API called slash info. Uh, it doesn't apply to a collection. It's, it's an admin API. Uh, anybody have any guesses what permissions are going to be checked and in what order? OK, yeah. So rule three is the only permission that's going to be checked. And if you're expecting kind of a top-down ordering, this is the opposite of what you would expect. Um, it's, maybe it's not that surprising, because the first two permissions here don't actually apply to the request. They're talking about specific collections and, and querying. Um, so let's see a different example. Um, so now, instead of, um, instead of making an admin request, let's say you're trying to query a, a collection called foo. Uh, what permissions? What permission do you think would would be checked for this request? Two, yeah. Two, yeah. Um, okay, so just permission two. This this uh, foo read permission. Um, so queries on admin requests. So it's all just going to skip over uh, digging up any admin related permissions. So um, we're good there. And next, Solar is going to look for permissions that specifically mention the collection receiving their request. We have one of those. It's permission two. That's what Solar ends up going with. Um, so this sort of thing catches users off guard on the mailing list all the time. You can see that you know, the first permission in that list should cover this request. It's not specific to the collection foo, but it covers it. Uh, so again, if people are expecting top down, they're going to be really kind of confused here. Um, anybody have any questions about that? OK, great. Does that mean that the dev role wouldn't have access, or that would fall back to that if it was the dev requesting so, that particular one? So that's a good question. So the question, I think it was only half caught on the mic, was um, what roles are going to be able to access collection foo? Is that right? Yeah. OK. Um, so since, since we have a permission that specifically specifies foo, then we would only look at the role there, so other. So the dev role is never going to be able to access foo. It, right, it's very counterintuitive. Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of wild that this is how it works. Uh, so another mistake, and I, I mentioned this in passing earlier, another mistake when, that people make when writing their permission list is, is forgetting that the, the names they're using matter. So the, the name property is useful for describing what you want your permission to do. But if you're using a predefined permission, this also specifies the behavior. Um, so people, people forget this, and a lot of times they'll add uh, a method property or a path property or something to their predefined permission. Um, and Solar doesn't like that. You might submit your security.json. You might upload it to ZooKeeper. And because you're just uploading a file to ZooKeeper, you don't get an error. But if you check the log, Solar blows up trying to read it. And it's just going to ignore the, the new stuff you just put in ZooKeeper. Um, and so what you occasionally see on the mailing list is a user who reports that Solar isn't taking their security.json changes into account. They say, you know, I keep uploading it, I keep uploading it, it's not paying attention or it's slow. Um, but what the problem is is that there's a problem with their security.json. Uh, one final point of confusion with the, the rule-based auth plugin is that the predefined permissions built into Solar are kind of vague, they're kind of ambiguous. Um, so let's take the read permission as an example here. Um, what exactly does it let users read? Is it enough to give users uh, read access on the whole cluster? Is that what it does? Does it control document querying? Does that include exporting? Uh, does it let you read the schema? Does it include the export handler? Um, how about reading metrics or, or schema stuff? Uh, so there's a ton of ambiguity in a name as simple as read. It's, it's hard to convey much information with that. Does anybody want to guess what, uh, what read actually controls? Yeah, so just queries. Uh, the read permission allows access to, to most endpoints of the return documents. And here, that's export and select. So it's, it's interesting. You can, you can get all of the documents in your collection, but you can't figure out what the schema is, which is um, interesting. Um, so we, we've seen a couple different points of confusion um, when writing permission lists. Um, 
I have another example here, but I, I think I'm short on time, so I might uh, skip over it. But there's, there's one more question. Um, so given, uh, given these permissions and these roles, we have three roles, A, B, and C. Um, which of those roles is able to update, uh, let's say, the system collection? Anybody have any guesses? Okay, it's a, it's a bit of a trick question. Our permissions here only really apply to reading. Um, and how, how Solar, how rule-based authorization in Solar handles this is that if you don't have a particular permission kind of locking down an API, everyone has access to it. So all of the roles would, would be able to update to the system collection, um, which is really kind of surprising. Um, so to, to sum up some of the common traps that we, we ran into, only the first matching permission is considered for a request. Um, permissions aren't processed in the order that they appear in security.json. Uh, the names matter. So overriding uh, method, params, and, and other attributes can cause problems if you're using a predefined permission. Um, the names themselves on the predefined permissions can be confusing. Uh, and, and lastly, this failing open. If you don't have a specific permission denying something, uh, if no permissions match, then your request is going to be allowed. And it may or may not be what you expect. Uh, so with these quirks in mind, I think there's a few things that it, admins can do to simplify setting up and troubleshooting uh, rule-based authorization configurations. Um, first, since Solar is only going to consider your first matching permission that it finds, uh, it's useful to structure your permission list in such a way that your most specific permissions appear at the top, and the more general ones come down below. People typically expect it to work top to bottom, so structuring it in, in that way um, might make the list a little more intuitive. Uh, next, if you don't want Solar to fail open, if no permission matches, uh, then you probably want to add an all permission at the very end of your permission list to, to catch anything that might fall through any, anything else in the list. Uh, we talked about watching out for name collisions with Solar's predefined permissions, and there's, a, there's an easy way to avoid that. Uh, if you're making a custom permission, just prefix it with custom dash or something like that to, to avoid accidentally triggering a, a predefined permission. Uh, the last and I think the most important tip for using rule-based auth in Solar is to have something that you can run to catch regressions when you change your security.json. Um, even, you even if you keep the security traps that we're talking about in mind, uh, even if you know exactly what you're doing, um, mistakes happen. You might run the wrong curl command out of your bash history. You might upload, upload the wrong file to Zookeeper. Stuff happens. Um, so it's good to have something to use to, to run every time you change your security.json to, to watch out for any of these little gaps opening up. Um, if you don't have a, a really involved permission matrix, sometimes maybe just a bash list and a, or a bash script and a couple for loops is enough. Um, if you're using something more involved, then you might want a, a JUnit test suite or, or something like that that you can run. Um, in a more structured way. Um, so that's, that's everything that I had. Um, so these slides, I'm going to upload them at, at that link um, when I get home tonight, actually. So if, if anybody wants to take a look at that, or uh, there'll be links there as well to the other uh, solar security talks that I, I mentioned in, in years past. Um, so thanks for coming and, and listening. Uh, do you guys have any questions uh, you can ask right now? Yeah. Does Solar have a mechanism to authenticate to the uh, JSON web key URL? N not that I saw when I was looking into this. Um, it's possible, uh, but I, I haven't seen anything for that now. I was wondering about other best practices around securing Zookeeper then also? Anything you know, that you've written up? Um, so there is, there is some documentation on this in the ref guide. It, I don't think it's our best documentation in the ref guide. Um, and I, I kind of specifically steered clear of it for this talk because it's a, it's a bit of a rabbit hole to get into. Um, but it, yeah, maybe we can talk after, but I'd rather not get into it. Hi. Um, 
the JSON web token, you gave the example where there's a claim for a sub subject, right? You put in username. And let's say you have a case where the subject value is actually a GUID. So where in the configuration do you map that GUID into, let's say, a role inside? Where is that mapping from the subject value? And can, that's one question. The second question is, can you get solar to use a different claim for the, for the for, rather than using subject, maybe we have a custom claim that says username, and we want to use username. Okay, so uh, for, first question first, I guess. Yeah. Let, me, uh, let me try to get to an example of a security.json here that we can, we can talk about. You had a great one earlier with the claims on it. Yeah, the problem is finding it. <laughs> How about that? Okay. Um, so, so your question was, uh, when a jot comes in with a subfield that specifies a user or a GUID or whatever, right. Right. Uh, where does that user get recorded in security.json? Right, or how do you map, him it, map that <coughs> person or that subject into something that Solar understands? Right. Uh, so with the authentication plugin, you're, you're only kind of doing authentication. Right. So Solar doesn't check the user is being in a, a like with the basic authentication plugin, there's a, a list of users yep. Yep. in security.json. There's, there's, no, um, there's no equivalent of that in the JOT plugin. Right. So as long as there is a user and the token isn't expired and these other uh, properties aren't um, contradicted, then whatever the username is, Solar's gonna accept that. Now, if you're using the rule-based authorization plugin, um, then you would have to declare that user um, specifically, or at least in the, the role section, you would have right. to, to describe what role they belong to. So you'd have to take, let's say it's sub, you'd have to put user, user role mapping would have to be sub to role. Right. Now, is it always gonna use the sub claim, or can you, use a, can you tell Sol to use a different claim for that mapping? As far as I know, it always uses the sub claim. Um, I didn't, I didn't see a property for that, but um, it, it would be interesting to add at least. Okay, thanks. Apologize for getting a little off topic, but uh, are you aware of any of these security authentication mechanisms allowing it to work with streaming expressions or CDCR? You said streaming expressions or CDCR? Correct. Okay. I don't know much about CDCR. I can't speak to that. All right. Um, I do know a lot of the streaming expressions as you use them are, um, streaming expressions don't hit a back door. Um, so, so they make the same curl request that, um, or they make, they make a, they hit the same URLs that um, an external query would. So I think you can set up, um, you can set up JOT authentication with streaming expressions and that works. You can use rule-based authorization with streaming expressions and that works. Uh, CDCR I'm less sure of, just because I, that's not something that I've used before. All right, I might ask you about that streaming expression solution because that's a bugaboo for us. Okay, I'm happy to talk afterwards. access or potentially catch all then suddenly you can't use a v2 api i guess when you'd like to yeah. right i I'd, I'd have to double check that but it's it's um it definitely sounds like a concerning uh opening possibly um <laughs> that's <laughs> uh yeah yeah that's one of the many problems with the v2 api <laughs> already has you know a lot of this stuff sorted out so the the external plugins that I've seen and that I've um, had some experience with are, are Ranger and Sentry I haven't heard of um, Shiro did you say yeah uh, I there may be a plugin but I haven't seen it any other questions uh, thank you for coming in uh, uh, please uh, check in and rate this uh, presentation in uh, the Activate app, if you could. That would be helpful. Thank you so much again for coming. Thanks, everyone.